welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Rate and review the show at kevinmd.com slash rate. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash follow. Today in the show, we have Russell Phillips. He's an internal medicine physician and he co-wrote the Kevin MD article, Flip the Access, Primary Care Rotations. Russell, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Kevin. It's great to be here. So we'll get into your article in a little bit. First off, briefly share your story and journey to where you are today. Uh, sure. I'm a primary care general internist and went <clears throat> went into medicine really intending to do primary care. Love the relationships with patients that you have an opportunity to, to make and, and maintain in primary care. Did rotations when I was a student in family medicine and, and actually worked in a diagnostic clinic at at Stanford, where we sort of help primary care physicians who are in trouble making difficult diagnoses sometimes with patients. Ended up training at Beth Israel Hospital in, in internal medicine, where they had a primary care residency. Went on to do a general medicine fellowship program. Have done research for many years. Was the division chief at BIDMC in primary care and general medicine. And then starting in 2012, we directed the Center for Primary Care at Harvard Medical School. Wonderful. And like you, I'm an internal medicine primary care physician myself, and I'm sure we're going to have a vigorous conversation in terms of how we can keep primary care thriving despite the many challenges and obstacles that it faces. So you co-wrote this article, Flip the Access Primary Care Rotations. Now, for those who didn't get a chance to read your article, just walk my audience through it, share the story why you decided to write it. Sure. <clears throat> what we wrote about really is the experience that our students are getting in primary care and trying to address the question of why it is that many students come into medical school thinking that they might want to do primary care, but unfortunately leave deciding they want to do something else. And one of the factors that's associated with staying in primary care is really the experience that our students have and in primary care. And unfortunately, many of our students have experiences and practices that are not well organized, are often have some level of dysfunction, are staffed by primary care physicians who are you know, to some extent burned out and unhappy in the field and then are immersed in a culture that is not supportive of primary care. And the question is really, how can we change that? And I think part of the answer is by really trying to intentionally change the experience that our students have when they do primary care, make sure that they are in practices where they're exposed to the best of primary care, where they are precepted and taught by primary care physicians who are enjoying what they're doing and, and are, you know, want to continue doing that and want to see students go into primary care. And I recognize that that's a challenge. So it means that we not only have to find those practices, but sometimes as medical schools invest in those practices, because in fact, many times the practices aren't working well, because it's just that there isn't enough investment in primary care. So the last time I rotated through a primary care clinic as a resident, that was almost 20 years ago. So those who aren't familiar with that medical school experience rotating through primary care, just describe to my audience, what, what exactly was that like? Because for me, I remember it was pretty much one afternoon a week, and this was sometime in the midst of inpatient rotations, and you just have to finish rounding, rush off to your primary care clinic, be there by one o'clock, do primary care until five, and then perhaps come back to the hospital, finish your inpatient work. So that, that was what my experience was. So Tell me what it is now currently for medical students rotating through primary care clinics. Yeah, so that unfortunately continues to be <clears throat> really the model, you know, for, I think it, it also, though, depends a lot on whether you're in family medicine training or internal medicine training, but certainly for medical students who are rotating through primary care, often will be doing in the context of an internal medicine period of when they're on, also on the wards in internal medicine, meaning that they're in the hospital, they'll spend a half day in the clinic. They will be rushing down to the clinic, just as you say, they will still have patients who are sick in the hospital, so they'll be distracted. They'll be working in a clinic where they're precepted by somebody who they may not know that well and doesn't know them you know, that well. They don't really get a sense of the team that they're working with in the clinic or the resources that are available. 
and uh, and it becomes it, it becomes more of a negative experience than a positive one. All right. So tell me some of your solutions to to fix some of these issues because from what you're describing and from what I remember, you're right. It doesn't seem like the most positive shine that we could put on primary care. Yeah. So I think, you know, the value of primary care is really, you know, things that Barbara Starfield, who is a researcher, really, you know, helped define and, and demonstrate the value of primary care, who is at Johns Hopkins. And she talked about sort of continuity, comprehensiveness, you know, first contact care coordination as being sort of the things that that happen in primary care that really bring value to what we do. And continuity is a big part of that. And when I mentioned, you know, what drew me to primary care was the relationships with patients. I think it's really important to create opportunities so that students can create those relationships. So what I actually favor is a longitudinal experience in primary care that really goes through the four or five years of medical school, depending on how long someone is there. I should mention at Harvard, 80% of our students actually are at medical school for five years often because they're doing a research project mm -hmm. or master's within the context of that program. That's not true everywhere, of course. But what I would love to see would be a continuity experience in primary care. And we do some of that at Harvard, where we have something called the Foundational Continuity Clerkships, where the first year students, in fact, the first few weeks of school, students are introduced to a primary care practice. Ideally, that's the same primary care practice where they will then do their primary care clerkship during their second year. Unfortunately, during years three and four, they move away from primary care, and that's a real time that we have challenges retaining interest in primary care. But ideally, that clerkship experience would continue through years three and four so that students are continuing to be engaged. And potentially during years three and four, are not only seeing patients, but also engaged in primary care transformation, or at least some aspects of that through doing quality improvement projects or innovation projects within that primary care practice as well. Some other important elements really are that it should be a heavily curated experience, meaning that we create those opportunities and practices that really show the best of primary care mm -hmm. with intensive team-based work, where there's behavioral health integration, for instance, where there's screening for social determinants of health, where there are resources around addressing patient social determinants of health, and where there's also ready access to specialists through things like e-consults and things like that. And there's certainly some practices that do it, do all of these things, but not enough, which is why I think it requires medical students, both medical schools supposed to think about it how they can create this continuity experience, but also help to identify and resource practices so that students really do have an ideal experience within primary care practices. I want to follow up on that because I think one of the things that you said earlier that detract from students' interest in primary care is not having those positive primary care role models for one reason or the other. Those primary care clinicians could be under a tremendous amount of stress and pressure and paperwork, electronic medical records, understaffing, a whole host of issues. So what are some ways that we can give students more of those positive role models? Because you know, I'm sure you're pressured, I'm pressured, and and sometimes it's not our best face that we give to students in the primary care setting. What are some ways that we can solve that? Yeah, so, you know, key to that is, is in some ways following up on the recommendations of the National Academies of Science. You know, one of those a committee that met on primary care, and the first was really thinking about payment. And so it's clearly clear that, pay, that primary care is under-supported. And when I said medical schools need to invest, it either may be medical schools investing or changes occurring, you know, at a larger level in terms of how we support primary care. But right now, only five to 6% of the primary care, of the total medical spend goes into primary care. So if you think of, you know, Medicare patient who on average spends $14,000 a year, you know, actually for Medicare, it's only around 3%. So we're only talking about several hundred dollars going to primary care for the care of an older patient, which is often, you know, very complex, needs additional resources. And clearly primary care practices need more support to meet those patients' needs. In Rhode Island, they doubled, for instance, the investment in primary care, which I think is what we need to do 
nationally, nationally, five or six percent of, of the spend goes to primary care. It should be 10 or 12 percent. And, and that will go a long way towards supporting some of the activities that I mentioned, such as behavioral health integration, where we have the collaborative care model for depression, for instance, and social workers embedded in the practice, uh, screening for social determinants, have community health workers who will help address patients' needs, where we can address equity and social justice within practices. I think all of those things together, to the extent that we can incorporate them into primary care in a really standard way would improve and, and burn out and, and sort of address some of the concerns. The other thing you mentioned is the EHR, which is a huge, you know, sort of issue. And we, we need to have better EHRs available. Right now, what we have are mostly designed around billing as opposed to team-based care and communication with other providers. And, and you know, it's just, we spend too much time entering data. And so, you know, that's something that needs to be fixed as well. And then in addition to investment, it's also how we're paid and we need to pay, move to a value-based payment so that we really are off the fee for service as sort of the, as the sort of the model for how we're paid because fee for service leads to a focus on RVUs, which focus on often low value short visits when I actually think we should be taking care of, especially in internal medicine, patients with complexity. And I think if we were able to do that, that also would address some of the burnout that we feel from, you know, seeing 20 patients a day, often for things that we don't need to be seeing them for, but chiefly because it generates RVUs for the practice. And we're really focusing on patients where we can make a difference. So, you know, all of the, those things have to happen as well to address, you know, some of the larger concerns that you just mentioned. We're talking to Russell Phillips. He's an internal medicine physician. He co-wrote the Kevin MD article, Flip the Access, Primary Care Rotations. Russell, so I want to talk about the role of advanced practice providers. A lot of primary care practices across the country, they have trouble recruiting physicians, and then they hire physician assistants and nurse practitioners to fill that primary care role. Medical students come up to me and they see this and they say, why should I go into primary care when I may be replaced by an advanced practice provider? So to those medical students who ask you that question, what do you say to that? That's a really good question, Kevin. And I think the role of advanced practice providers is really key to the function of a primary care practice. In my mind, they can also do many of the things that the primary care physician is right now spending time doing, which will offload the primary care physician, again, so they can focus on patients with complexity for whom they are best trained to care for through their care of hospitalized patients and their rotations through heart failure clinics and things like that, so that the primary care physician can spend time really thinking about diagnostic challenges, which for most physicians is one of the enjoyable and fun things about practice can problem solve for patients with advanced heart failure, or advanced lung disease, spend time consulting with specialists when, when need be, and also being involved in practice leadership and practice transformation. We will always have challenges in caring for patients through new things, new needs of patients. So, you know, an example is COVID where we had to totally reinvent what we did. There are going to be other things coming along, which won't, won't be pandemics, but things like the aging of our patient population that will require transformation. And we need medical students who are trained in innovation and transformation to serve as physicians in primary care to help lead that. And advanced practice practitioners can, in the meantime, be doing a lot of chronic care management, management of patients with straightforward hypertension, diabetes, you know, off, you know, preventive care. You know, we know that from a recent study was that was done, you know, it takes five hours a day or so mm -hmm. to do preventive care and care of our patients with chronic disease just by itself. And there's no way that there's sufficient time in a primary care physician's work day to be doing that all themselves. And there's no question that advanced practice practitioners can't do just as well as primary care physicians. So we should really be shifting that work to them so that we in primary care can take on some of the more challenging tasks. And not to say that advanced practice practitioners sometimes don't have a role in that as well, but they can certainly 
take on much of the work that's done in primary care. There's more than enough work to go around. So I would say to the student who is thinking about going into primary care that they will not be displaced, but rather they will be supported by advanced practice practitioners. And my final question, what are some of your take home messages that you wanna leave with the Kevin MD audience? Yeah, so I want to um, first say that primary care for me has been <clears throat> an incredibly rewarding specialty and experience, and I can't imagine doing anything any differently. You know, the opportunity to care for patients over a lifetime has been just incredibly satisfying. And again, I just can't imagine doing anything else. I am so supportive of students who want to do this work. You know, we also know that primary care is among the most high value work that a physician can do. Some of the work that we've done in the Center for Primary Care has actually helped to support some of Barbara Starfield's earlier work, where we've shown that the density of primary care physicians, more so than any other physician, correlates and is associated with life expectancy. And we've shown that if there are insufficient primary care physicians in an area, there can be up to a year drop in life expectancy. And for that reason, primary care is considered a common good, meaning that it, you know, it's something that everybody should have access to. So I think the first message is that you know, primary care is a great field. There's wonderful opportunity. The second is that the value of primary care is, you know, is undisputed. And then I think the third message is that really that medical schools need to recognize their social value of primary care as a common good and be really, you know, focusing on how it is that they can turn out more students who are focused on primary care as a career goal and support this, those students through their clinical experiences so that they leave medical school still wanting to focus on primary care. Russell, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. And thanks again for being on the show. Okay, thanks so much, Kevin. That was great.